The events of that day were to lead to one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the novelization of the 2003 remake by Stephen Hand. Chapter 7 What the hell was that? Panting with exertion and scared out of her wits by the crash of metal, Erin let old Monty fall back onto the floor. Something was wrong. She could feel it. She stepped over the fallen wheelchair, threw open the bathroom door, and ran out into the corridor. Behind her, the old man's face cracked into a strange expression. It seemed like a smile, but more knowing. If anything, the distortion of old Monty's weathered features was smug, malicious, a thinly disguised sneer. His flint-like eyes were narrow with the anticipation. Out in the hallway, Aaron bolted to where she thought the sound had come from. It seemed as if the whole building was still reverberating with that thunderous noise. Surely, Kemper must have heard it from outside. If he had, he might already be in the house. She turned left down the hall and came to the storage area. There was a lot of old junk in here. Something else. There was a door in the wall facing her. It was a hefty sliding door made of scored damaged metal, and it looked totally out of place. There was something about the huge sliding panel that filled Aaron with irrational fear, and she was only too glad to see it closed. Shivering, she turned her back to the door and looked down the length of the hall to the screen doors leading outside. Sunlight flooded in through the gauze, but failed to reach this far down the corridor. She took another quick look through the discarded bric-a-brac lying about the place, but there was nothing, nothing except damn junk. Hell, she was sure the noise had come from somewhere around here. She paused. What if, what if the sound had come from behind that weird door? The reluctant thought had barely entered the young woman's head when she heard a noise behind her, from behind the door. Aaron spun around. The door was still closed. The noise she just heard had sounded like a dull thud. Camper? She called. She still hadn't seen him. Was he outside the house, inside, or, or what? She walked over to the door and took a closer look at it. There was a bar handle fixed near the right edge. She tried it, but it was no good. Underneath the handle was a rusty latch, but she couldn't see any way to open that either. Again, she tried the handle pulling on it with all of her strength, but the sliding panel refused to budge. Feeling frustrated and increasingly scared, she took a step back and stared at the door and noticed a peephole. She hadn't seen it before. It was set up in the middle of the door and was about six feet off the ground, so Aaron had to get up on her tiptoes to look at it. As far as she could tell, the lens of the spyglass seemed to be set in the corner of a disc. This wasn't the usual simple round hole. People drilled through their front doors for security. It was something much more elaborate. The metal disc encasing the lens seemed to be held in a circular mount, as if the disc with the lens were separate from the rest of the door. Erin stretched up and put her eye to the glass, but it was useless. She couldn't see much, and what she did see was tiny and distorted. The only thing she did notice for sure was that the room on the other side of the door seemed to be lit up all pale green, which was kind of weird. Her calves started to ache, so she stepped down and tried putting her ear to the door. Maybe if she listened. Nothing. Aaron cursed. She was running out of ideas fast. Whatever was happening on the other side of that door, and whether the loud bang had come from in here, in there, or not, Aaron couldn't see, hear, or do anything and suddenly she was wondering whether any of this was her business in the first place. She'd only come looking because the noise had scared the hell out of her. It had been like the tolling of a giant funeral bell, 
and following on top of her crazy struggle with the double amputee, it, it had sent her into a panic. She felt the need to do something, anything. Kemper. Aaron turned and made ready to head straight back out the front porch, when suddenly she heard a dry metallic squeak come from behind her. Though Aaron didn't know it, someone had been watching her from the moment she'd run into the storage area at the end of the hallway. Someone had been observing her from the other side of the metal door, using the spyglass to intrude upon her every movement. The lens was mounted in a pivoted rim that could be angled left and right to follow the girl as she paced back and forth across the hallway. And he had followed her. He had watched her searching every dark corner. He had witnessed her feeble struggle with the door handle. He had seen her face and fisheye close up when she looked right into the spyglass. He was still tracking her with the moving eyepiece when the lens casing had rubbed noisily against the circular frame, metal on metal, rusty, screeching, suddenly making noise. She turned. The spyglass froze. Aaron spun on her heels and rushed back towards the door. That sound. The door was still closed, everything was still the same, but, but, the peephole, it had moved. Aaron was positive that when she first saw the spyglass, it had been flat, flush with the door, but now it seemed to be raised on one side and depressed on the other, almost as if, something wrong? Aaron jumped. It was old Monty. He was back in his wheelchair and was now facing her in the middle of the corridor blocking her way out of the house. There was something odd about his manner. Aaron half expected him to accuse her of deserting him when he needed her help, or maybe attack her for going off wandering around his house. But he said nothing, and he certainly didn't seem to have had any trouble getting up off the bathroom floor by himself. Suddenly, every instinct in Aaron's body screamed not to trust the old man. Legless or not, this guy was dangerous and she didn't like the way he was holding his cane. Aaron asked where he was. I don't know, answered old Monty defiantly. On the porch where you left him, I guess. What? shouted the girl, her head starting to spin. She had the impenetrable metal door behind her and the old man sitting in front. She was trapped, or was she? Seizing the initiative, Aaron ran forward and pushed her way right past the haggard old farmer practically shoving his wheelchair aside so that she could run down the hallway towards the front door. Behind her, old Monty massaged the sweaty right stump of his knee and leered, his dry lips glued with old spit. Pepper sat between Morgan and Andy on the porch of the abandoned cotton mill. All three of them were now sick of the place and couldn't wait for Kemper and Aaron to bring the sheriff. They hadn't seen Jedediah since he'd tried to shut them in the room full of crazy drawings. It was probably for the best because, whatever Pepper said, the kid was downright weird and both Morgan and Andy had taken a sharp dislike to his creepy little face. Time had now slowed to a standstill. It was hot, quiet, and depressing. None of them could see any bars, but it felt like they were locked in some kind of prison with no chance of parole. Not even death would bring an end to this eternity of just sitting here, waiting by the gin for nothing. But maybe there was a god after all. Pepper heard the car first, and soon all three of them were up on their feet. Someone was driving up along the trail they themselves had taken from the general store. Someone was coming. Morgan's first thought was that it might be another weirdo, another Luda May or another Jedediah, some fucked up hillbilly in a V-10 powered kill wagon or some shit. But it was Pepper who said it for all three of them. Oh, thank God. The vehicle was a police car, and the sight of it was truly manna from heaven. Morgan broke out into the biggest smile he'd had since his last joint. 
while Andy just shook his head with goddamned relief. The cops, they were finally here. He couldn't believe it. Kemper and Aaron had done it. They'd followed Jedediah's directions, gone up to the sheriff's house, and now he was here. Maybe the two of them were in the car with him. The red bubble light on the top of the police car was cracked, and the front end of the vehicle was dented. Matter of fact, the whole car looked like it had seen better days. If Kemper were around, he'd be able to tell you just how old the model was, but that just meant the car matched everything else they'd seen around here so far. Everything about the place was old, beat up and run down. No reason why the local police department should be any different. Still, all that mattered was that the sheriff should have had the full power of the law behind him so that he could come in and get this whole damn mess cleaned up. Sheriff Hoyt pulled up behind the van, but Andy was disappointed to see that the sheriff was alone. No Kemper, no Aaron. Unlike his automobile, Hoyt was tidy to the point of pristine. His uniform was crisply ironed with razor-sharp creases. His hat was firm and starched. His gold star gleamed with authority, and his hair was buzz-cut with military efficiency. The man himself was in his late forties and was solidly built. You wouldn't want to mess with Sheriff Hoyt, not now, not ever, and for that reason alone, his presence was immediately reassuring. Sheriff Hoyt was the kind of guy who immediately commanded respect, simply by the way he stood with calm, ramrod certainty. Sorry I'm late, he said as he got out of the squad car. Judging by his voice, the sheriff was a local boy and, just like Lou DeMay, his face was lined with wear and tear. Andy also noticed the sheriff could do with a shave, which was kind of surprising. Pepper rushed forward. You have no idea how glad we are to see you. Hoyt took the girl's gratitude in his stride as he moved around to the bloodstained window at the rear of the van. I'm guessing that's where the body is. The sense of relief growing among the kids was palpable. At long last, things were going their way. The sheriff had come. He'd take care of everything once Kemper and Aaron got back. The sheriff opened the side door of the A-100 and climbed on board. Pepper, Morgan, and Andy looked on, their bodies slick with layer upon layer of sweat. They would tried to follow the sheriff inside, but the stench of the corpse was too much. The moment Hoyt had opened the door, it had taken Morgan every ounce of his willpower not to chuck on the spot. Fortunately, the sheriff didn't have the same problem. He'd seen it all before many times, and... Neither the intense heat nor the smell of decaying flesh had any effect on him. Pepper watched as Hoyt methodically inspected the corpse. He lifted those oily rags off the girl's head. Pepper almost burst into tears. That face, the poor girl's face. He then checked her hands and her wrists, then her ankles, which Morgan thought was odd. Then the sheriff paused and took a moment to follow the bloodstains through the van tracing the spread pattern, the spray, the viscous arc, working out the angle of the kill, until finally he went and picked up the blood-smeared revolver they'd left lying in the girl's lap. Who does this belong to? he asked. She had it on her, said Andy before anyone else could reply. The way he saw it, he'd have to take care of things until Kemper got back. Hoyt nodded, then raised the barrel of the gun to his nose. He sniffed it. Then he lowered the gun, cocked the hammer, opened the cylinder, and checked the individual bullet chambers. Done. Moving sharply, he clicked everything neatly back into place and then said, You sure about that? Where the fuck is he? When Erin had reached the porch, she found that Kemper was gone. She'd almost expected it, but it still frightened and pissed her off. Old Monty had followed her outside and told her she could go look for the boy out back if she wanted to. And so here she was, walking the perimeter of the house and calling out her boyfriend's name. Maybe he went back to the old Crawford Mill suggested the old man as he effortlessly wheeled along just behind her, the dog standing in his lap. 
Erin shook her head, more in frustration than to disagree. If this was any kind of joke, or if Kemper had just got bored and gone back to the van, he could kiss their marriage and his child goodbye. The wind was blowing her long hair. She stopped and tucked it behind her ears, using the time to reconsider her options. Maybe the old man was right. Maybe Kemper had gone back, and she herself had to go meet the sheriff who was due at the mill any time now. Kemper! God damn him! She said huffily. Without saying goodbye to old Monty, she set off down the grassy rise and along the overgrown horse trail that would lead her back to the mill and her friends. As she went, Aaron fell to notice that something was moving in one of the ground floor windows of the Hewitt house. Someone was looking through the blinds, watching her, the fabric strips bending to reveal two insane eyes, savagely feeding on her tender, young image. The sheriff went and fetched a long roll of adhesive cellophane from the trunk of his automobile. Then he and the two boys began the unpleasant process of lifting the dead girl up from the rear seat of the van. Pepper could hardly bring herself to watch. It was almost unreal seeing her friends like that, working in silence, handling the corpse. But unknown to any of them, even the sheriff, someone was watching the whole scene through the blood-rimmed bullet hole of the rear window. Jedediah. Taking care to avoid being spotted, the boy watched attentively as the three men lifted the girl up from her resting place and slowly lugged her carcass out of the truck. Jedediah couldn't take his eyes off of her. Aaron walked as fast as she could through the tangled undergrowth. Dusk was still some hours away, but the sun had already begun its slow descent towards the horizon, casting long shadows all around her, and the arthritic limbs of the trees now appeared lower than before when Aaron and Kemper had come this way before. Kemper! She shouted. In fact, she hadn't stopped shouting all the way back from the farmstead. Kemper! She tried again when the sudden sound of a branch snapping somewhere behind her made her stop. Kemper, is that you? Silence. Heart pounding, the girl spun round and strained her eyes to see into the dense thicket of trees and bushes behind her. Then slowly, she turned in a gradual full circle, scrutinizing every plant, leaf, and damn blade of grass. Still nothing. Aaron picked up and almost ran the rest of the way back to the mill. When Andy first saw the roll of tape in Hoyt's hand, he thought the sheriff was going to use it to seal the van or cordon the scene of the incident. He had no idea that Hoyt was going to ask Morgan and him to help get the girl down on the floor so that the sheriff could then use the tape to wrap her up like an insect in a damned cocoon. But that's what he did. The sheriff simply peeled the end of the tape off the spool, stuck the end of the tape to her feet, then pulled the spool around and around her body, round and round the tape went, binding, encasing. Hoyt had asked the boys to help, pick her feet up, hold her back, lift her head, until finally the dead girl looked like a cellophane mummy, the adhesive shroud so tight that only the tiniest drops, the finest drops of blood, could escape through the shining, striated plastic. When all was done, the sheriff asked the boys to help carry her body over to the back seat of the patrol vehicle. Hoy held the door open as the two frightened young men struggled to get the corpse inside. Rigor mortis was already starting to affect the dead tissue. It just seems wrong, said Pepper, unable to believe the sight in front of her eyes. Her friends, carting this shrink-wrapped body like 
like a pack of meat. God, no. Pepper dashed that sick thought out of her mind. It was crazy. Everything must be getting to her. Young lady, replied the sheriff firmly, I have nothing but the utmost respect for the dead, but if I don't get this girl on ice right quick, she sure to rot. Andy saw that Pepper was about to say something, but stopped her. Thanks so much for your help. He blurted. Really? Then he turned to Pepper, his face a clear signal for her to keep her mouth shut. They were getting there. Everything was almost done. Why risk pissing the sheriff off? With Hoyt's help, Andy and Morgan were finally able to hoist the body into position on the back seat of the police car where it lay, wrapped and bleeding. The sheriff wiped a hand across his upper lip. I'd stay with you until your friends get back, he said. But if I do... He motioned to the body on the back seat, then kicked the car door shut. No problem, said Morgan enthusiastically. Thanks again, Sheriff. So am I, said the Sheriff, walking round to the driver's side. Old Monty isn't one for keeping company, anyway. He paused. Sure you know how to find your way out? No problem, Morgan repeated. Thanks again, Sheriff. Hoyt held Morgan's stare for a moment. The kid kept smiling, willing the sheriff to be on his way. Finally, he removed his hat and climbed inside the vehicle. Then he started the engine, reversed his car away from the van, turned round and drove back down the access road towards the highway. As the patrol car pulled away, Morgan looked down at his hands. He would have given anything for some hot water and a bar of soap. Through the sliding metal door beyond the small square room with its pale green strip light, through another door, down a long narrow staircase of rough paneled walls, the stairs made of the wooden slats and finally into the basement. Kemper opened his eyes and wished he hadn't. The basement was a dark cramped expanse of nightmarish rusted violence. Everywhere Kemper looked, he saw the disarray of a diseased fucking mind. Shelves cluttered with tools, blood-stained knives, jars, rows and rows of glass jars filled with God knows what. Pulleys, bits of broken bones lashed together with horse leathers, chain shoes, an old mangled wheel dangling from a rope in midair. Hooks, ropes, mortician scales, wooden beams, discarded fucking furniture. Pipes ran along the ceiling up the walls, twisting through the corroded mayhem of the purposely collected psychotic debris. There was a bathtub lying on the floor in front of a blazing ornate cast iron furnace. There were animal snares, farming tools, bottles, items of luggage, shelves, more shelves, and buckets filled with fetid, shit-smelling broth, a busted-up piano, a whole pile of trash, and a meat cleaver. Much of the basement floor was hidden beneath two inches of filthy black water, coagulating in places into venereal sump, the mud and shit of previous acts of abomination. It was dark down there with no real light except for a feeble yellow glow from the furnace and a thick shaft of sunlight that shone down through a jagged hole high up in one of the walls. There were oil lanterns scattered about, but... None of them were lit, leaving Kemper to stare feebly towards the sharp rays of freedom, reminding him of how he once took green fields for granted. He choked from the stink. Nothing in the van compared to this. Nothing. Not even the slaughterhouse they'd passed this morning. Toxic. Carnal. Death. What, what, what are you doing? Slurred Kemper. He'd heard his attacker shuffling about among the cancerous implements of this blackened kill pit 
long before he'd seen him. And when Kemper finally did see the skin-stealing motherfucker, it was a, as a distorted reflection in the meat cleaver. But suddenly the heaving mound of murderous insanity was upon him. Kemper could see the mask he'd stitched together, the skin flapping loosely as he came charging forward. Don't stop! Oh. Kemper shouted. He tried to move, but even if his limbs had obeyed him, he would have found that he'd been completely and totally bound. The sharp edge of the heavy cleaver came down on Kemper, silencing his protest with the asphyxiation of blood. Kemper felt bubbles bursting in his throat, but though he struggled, he oddly felt as if he no longer cared. In his fading delirium, Kemper noticed the killer was wearing a tie. It was a black tie. At last, Kemper understood that his body was about to become a plaything in the smothering, eager hands of the snorting maniac. A tear formed in the boy's staring eye, and he managed silent thanks that he would not be around when the final violation of his body took place. One desperate crumb of comfort. One pathetic consolation. In abject, mortal enslavement. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Chapter 7 of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the novelization of the remake by Stephen Hand. Uh, I wanted to have this chapter out uh, this past Friday, um, but I'm actually a caretaker, caregiver. Uh, that's my job. I'm a 24-7 live-in uh, nurse, pretty much. And I got my second vaccine Friday, and I was one of the lucky few that got really, really hardcore side effects from it. Uh, I was pretty much on my back for days. Uh, but uh, I started feeling better yesterday. Started working on this last night. When you're hearing this, it should be out on Tuesday. Uh, hope you enjoyed this chapter. Things are really picking up now. Kemper is gone. Uh, thank you to Stephen Palamo for not only voicing Kemper but for supporting the channel on Patreon. You did a great job, man, voicing uh, Kemper through all these chapters. Uh, thank you so much. Hope you had fun doing that, and thank you uh, for supporting the channel. Um, I'm excited that the sheriff showed up. He's one of my favorite characters, probably right underneath Leatherface. Uh, I'm curious to see what little extras we're going to get with him, uh, you know, with the Hewitt family. There's so much more to come, guys, and I hope you're enjoying the story so far. Uh, but from this point on, things uh, this is where it really picks up. So I'm excited to see what's coming. Uh, let me know what you thought of this chapter, and I'll be back very soon with more of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre by Stephen Hand. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian saying thanks for listening, be excellent to each other, and... <laughs>